August 2024 has been a month of reflection and sorrow in Hollywood. We've lost some of the most beloved stars of the entertainment world, whose contributions have left an indelible mark on the industry. In today's video, we'll take a moment to honor and remember the Hollywood legends who passed away this August. These iconic figures entertained and inspired us for decades, and their legacies will continue to live on. Roger Cook, known to viewers of PBS's long-running series, this old house as the landscaper with a solution to every problem and an answer to every question, died August 21st following a lengthy illness. He was 70. His death was announced on this old house's official website. I remember every lesson from Roger, said this old house executive producer, Chris Wolf, in a statement. More importantly, there are millions of people whose lives have been enriched by everything Roger taught them. Cook's involvement with the popular home renovation series spanned nearly 40 years. He first appeared on the show for the series' second season in 1982 and signed on full-time as the landscape contractor for season 10 in 1988. When asked this old house debuted in 2002, Cook was part of the team, providing landscape advice directly to homeowners. Cook continued with the franchise until health issues prompted his retirement in 20-20. Roger was our much-loved colleague, treasured by the entire This Old House community for his soft-spoken but no-nonsense approach to every aspect of landscape contracting, the show's website tribute reads. He was always there with the answers we needed. Born in 1954, Cook grew up in Burlington, Massachusetts, and was still in college at the University of Maine when he began working with local landscapers and tree firms. With a degree in wildlife management and conservation law, he founded K&R Landscape with wife Kathleen in 1982. The business, under different ownership, remains in operation. Roger's specialty and passion was plants, and no one was more knowledgeable, said Fred Pendleton, Roger's longtime friend and now co-owner of K&R Landscape with colleague Tom Pika. You could ask Roger any question about any plant, which ones would survive shade, how to treat diseases, which perennials or annuals to choose, the best woody plants or deciduous trees for a certain backyard, even the Latin names for everything. And he knew it. Cook's health issues predate his departure from the series, first surfacing in 2018. At that time, he announced he was considering stepping down. I have enjoyed the opportunity to share my knowledge and passion for landscaping, he said at the time and my life has been greatly enriched by the professional relationships and friendships I've formed over the years. I truly appreciate our fans' dedication and the concern for my well-being. Rest assured that I am in good hands and please know that I am grateful for all of your support. Cook, who lost wife Kathleen to cancer in 2010, is survived by son Jason, daughter Molly, brother Greg, daughter-in-law Anna, and grandsons Peter, Noah, and James. John Aprea, the actor known for his roles in The Godfather Part II and Full House, has died. He was 83. According to his manager, Will Levine, Aprea died of natural causes on Monday, August 5th at his Los Angeles home, where he was surrounded by family. Born March 4th, 1941 in Englewood, New Jersey, Aprea made his on-screen debut in 1968's Bullet, alongside Steve McQueen. He went on to one of his most memorable performances as young Tessio, in The Godfather Part II, after auditioning to play Michael Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's original 1972 film. Aprea once said working with Coppola and actors Al Pacino and Robert De Niro was the high point of his career, adding, I was surrounded by the best in The Godfather. He also appeared in such films as The Stepford Wives, New Jack City, The Game, Dead Man on Campus, and The Manchurian Candidate. Aprea had a recurring role on Full House and later Fuller House as Jesse's father, Nick Katsopoulos. His TV credits also include The Gangster Chronicles, Matt Houston and Knott's Landing, as well as episodes of Wonder Woman, Three's a Crowd, The A-Team, Alfred Hitchcock, Presents, The Fall Guy, Falcon Crest, Tales from the Dark Side, Night Court, Melrose Place, Saved by the Bell, the New Class, and The Sopranos. Aprea's Knott's Landing co-star Paul Carafotes paid tribute to the late actor on Saturday. We had lots of laughs, he wrote in part. We met on the set of CBS television show Knott's Landing 1987 over 40 years ago. Many will miss this man. Rest, old friend. I'll see you on the other side. 
Fitness guru Richard Simmons' death was a result of complications from recent falls and heart disease, according to his brother, Lenny Simmons. A spokesperson for the Simmons family, Tom Este, told People on Wednesday, this morning, Richard Simmons' brother Lenny received a call from the L.A. County Coroner's Office. He explained, The coroner informed Lenny that Richard's death was accidental due to complications from recent falls and heart disease as a contributing factor. The toxicology report was negative other than medication Richard had been prescribed. The family wishes to thank everyone for their outpouring of love and support during this time of great loss. His death was originally deferred, as additional testing by the medical examiner's office was needed. Simmons was found dead on July 13th, a day after his 76th birthday at his Hollywood Hills home. Born and raised in Louisiana, Simmons admitted he weighed 268 pounds when he graduated high school. By adjusting his eating habits and incorporating moderate exercise, he managed to lose weight. It was a methodology that he shared with millions over his career. He moved to Los Angeles in the 1970s and opened a fitness studio, Slimmons in Beverly Hills. His following there grew into the nationally syndicated The Richard Simmons Show on TV, where he gave fitness instructions to viewers at home. The show ran for four years and earned multiple Emmy Awards. He later was behind one of the all-time biggest fitness video empires with his Sweat Into the Oldies video series. Simmons released 65 fitness videos over the course of his life, which sold more than 20 million copies, and authored nine books and three cookbooks, according to his website. In January, he spoke out against an upcoming biopic being made about his life-starring actor and comedian Pauly Shore, which Simmons said he never permitted. I have never given my permission for this movie, so don't believe everything you read, he wrote on Facebook at the time. I no longer have a manager, and I no longer have a publicist. I just try to live a quiet life and be peaceful. Thank you for all your love and support. Jody Frisch, an accomplished communications executive with a career spanning decades in both Hollywood and Washington, D.C., died August 23rd after a short battle with pancreatic cancer. She was 68. Throughout her career, Frisch held key positions at organizations such as the WGA, SAG-AFTRA, the American Humane Association, BGR Group, and the National Foreign Trade Council. A native of Los Angeles who grew up in the San Fernando Valley and attended Birmingham High School, Frisch immediately embarked on a publicity career. Her work spanned a range of industries, and she was known for her expertise in executing numerous media campaigns, crisis and reputation management initiatives, and public policy advocacy efforts. Early on, Frisch worked for producer Cameron McIntosh in publicizing The Phantom of the Opera and Miss Saigon. She also had stints at Planned Parenthood and Craig Anderson Prods, and served as the personal publicist for actress Meredith Baxter in the 1990s. Away from work, Frisch was an animal lover and advocate for women's rights. A memorial service celebrating Frisch's life and accomplishments will be held in the coming months. While she had no immediate family, Frisch cultivated a wide circle of longtime friends who provided support and comfort during her final days. Maxi Solters, a writer, producer, actor, and third-generation Hollywood publicist, has died. She was 37. Maxi died unexpectedly on Thursday at Providence St. Joseph Medical Center in Burbank. A cause of death was not immediately available. She joined Scoop Marketing in 2012, continuing the family's legacy from her father Larry Solters and late grandfather Lee Solters. During her time at the agency, Maxi worked with such clients as the KIA Forum, the Hollywood Bowl, and Music Forward, among others. A vibrant and invaluable member of the Scoop marketing team, Maxie brought a unique blend of creativity, passion, and expertise to her work. The company shared in a statement, adding, her infectious enthusiasm, positivity, innovative ideas, and unwavering dedication made her an inspiration to all who knew her. Born March 27, 1987 in Sherman Oaks, Maxie studied theater at the University of Southern California before going on to work in film and television casting. As a writer, producer, and actress, Maxie had accumulated several credits to her name since 2006, including Climax, the 2017 web series she created and starred in. She was also a voting member of the Screen Actors Guild. Additionally, Maxie served as a coordinator for One Billion Rising, in addition to being involved with V-Day International and Women's Rights. 
Her advocacy work was a testament to her compassion and desire to create a better future, Scoop shared. Her unwavering optimism and kind heart touched the lives of many, leaving a lasting legacy of love and kindness. Maxie is survived by her longtime partner, Dim Dobrin, and their dog, Pookie, as well as her father, Larry, and his partner, Carol Greenhut, her mother, Deborah Graff, her aunt, Susan Reynolds, and her cousin, Jonah Reynolds. Phil Donahue, the longtime host of the trend-setting TV talk show, The Phil Donahue Show, died Sunday evening following a long illness, surrounded by family, including his longtime wife, actor Marlo Thomas. He was 88. His death was announced on the Today Show this morning. Today shared a statement from Donahue's family. See the announcement below. Calling Donahue a daytime staple, who pioneered a format that had been replicated by others, Today hosts noted that Donahue had been presented a Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Joe Biden just this summer. Donahue was married to Thomas for more than 40 years, having met when the That Girl star met Donahue when she was a guest on his talk show. The family statement reads, Groundbreaking TV talk show journalist Phil Donahue died Sunday night at home surrounded by his wife of 44 years, Marlo Thomas, his sister, his children, grandchildren, and his beloved golden retriever, Charlie. Donahue was 88 years old and passed away peacefully following a long illness. Donahue was born December 21, 1935 in Cleveland, and in the late 1950s embarked on a career as a radio journalist, at first in his hometown, and then Adrian, Michigan. But it was his TV work in Dayton, Ohio, that truly launched not only Donahue's career, but what would become a novel and highly influential style of daytime talk TV. In 1959, he was hired as a TV reporter at Dayton's WHIO, where his empathetic style of interviewing was first noticed by the public and his bosses. Within four years, he also had a radio call-in show called Conversation Piece for WHIO's affiliated radio station. Within several more years, he had taken his talk endeavor to TV hosting a business show and co-anchoring the evening news. In 1967, he was scooped up by a competing Dayton station, WLWD, who offered him a daytime morning interview show with a studio audience. With a studio audience that was treated by Donahue with respect, the host would make his way through the seats and hand over the mic to audience members with questions for guests. The Phil Donahue show became a Dayton area staple and favorite. Donahue is regarded as an early advocate for women, giving his largely female audience the opportunity to speak and ask questions on serious topics rather than the homey sea subjects that so many daytime talkers focused on. Jerry Fuller, a hit-making songwriter whose works were recorded by Ricky Nelson, Gary Puckett, Reba McIntyre, Sam Cooke, Lawrence Welk, The Kingston Trio, Billy Eckstein, Engelbert Humperdinck, and more, died July 18th at his home in Los Angeles at 85. The cause was complications of lung cancer, his wife, Annette Fuller, said to the New York Times. Fuller specialized in pop love songs. His first major hit was Travelin' Man, which Ricky Nelson took to the top of the Billboard Hot 100 in 1961. Fuller and friend Glenn Campbell were major players in the Los Angeles recording studio scene of the 1960s. In 1968, his output included Smith's recording of Little Green Apples, which reached number two on the Billboard chart. Working as an A&R producer for Columbia Records, Fuller discovered Puckett performing in a San Diego bowling alley. Together, they produced four singles that sold one million or more copies for the band. Woman, Woman, and three songs Fuller wrote, Young Girl, Lady Willpower, and Over You. Born in 1938 in Fort Worth, Texas, Fuller began his recording career there, but soon dropped out of college to move to Los Angeles. He was drafted into the Army in 1962 and spent his two-year hitch stationed in New York State. Fuller left Columbia Records in 1971 and became an independent producer. He began writing country songs for singers, including Ray Price and McIntyre. Survivors include his wife, their children, Adam and Anna Fuller, his brother, Bill, and a sister, Claudine West. French acting star Alain Delon whose many iconic roles included Le Samurai, Plan Soleil, and The Leopard, has died in France at the age of 88. The actor's children said in a statement that their father had passed away in the early hours of Sunday, surrounded by his family and beloved Belgian shepherd Lubo, in his longtime chateau home in the village of Duchy, 
in the Le Loire region, some 100 miles south of Paris. Delon's death marks the passing of one of the last surviving icons of the French cinema scene of the 1960s and 70s, when the country was on an economic roll as it reconstructed in the wake of World War II. The star, who was at the peak of this career from the 1960s to the 1980s, fell into acting by chance. Born on November 8, 1935 in the Paris suburb of Sceaux, he had a turbulent childhood after his parents divorced when he was still young. After training briefly as a butcher in his stepfather's business, he entered military school at the age of 17. After being caught stealing equipment, he was given the choice of expulsion or signing up for a tour of duty in Southeast Asia. Delon fought in the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, but wound up in trouble again after he crashed a jeep he had stolen and returned to France in 1956. Having moved to Paris, where he did odd jobs to make ends meet, Delon got his first introduction to the cinema world through his relationship with actress Brigitte Aubert, who had recently appeared in Alfred Hitchcock's To Catch a Thief. After they hooked up, she took him to the Cannes Film Festival in 1957, where he met the actor and director Jean-Claude Brioli, as well as his future agent Georges Bohm. I came down with a girl that I liked, who loved me. I took it all in, did the red carpet, but even then, I felt at home. Not least, and I say this without pretension, because it was made clear to me that I was not bad looking. He told a Cannes Masterclass in 2019. His next big break came via the actress Michelle Cordu, with whom he had an affair. She convinced her husband, director Yves Allegre, to give him a small role in his film Quand la femme s'en mêle. Delon was candid about the role women had played in his early career. If I hadn't met the women I met, I would have died long ago. It's the women, I don't know why, who loved me, who got me into this profession, who wanted me to do it, and who fought for me to do it. He told a master class at the Cannes Film Festival in 2019. His career took off quickly from there, with Delon then appearing in Marc Allegre's Sois Belle et Tétoi, which also featured Jean-Paul Belmondo in the cast, followed by Pierre Gaspard Wheat's Christine, which would see Delon appear opposite Romy Schneider. Jack Russell, lead vocalist for 1980s hair metal group Great White, died Thursday from multiple system atrophy and Lewy body dementia, Rolling Stone reported. He was 63. Russell announced his retirement from touring last month after his diagnosis. I am unable to perform at the level I desire and at the level you deserve, Russell said on social media at the time. Words cannot express my gratitude for the many years of memories, love, and support. He was remembered today by his family. Jack is loved and remembered for his sense of humor, exceptional zest for life, and unshakable contribution to rock and roll, where his legacy will forever thrive, his family wrote in an online statement. Founded in Los Angeles in 1977, Great White rode the mid-1980s metal wave with the million-selling 1987 album Once Bitten and its double platinum 1989 follow-up. Twice Shy, the band songs Rock Me and Ian Hunter cover Once Bitten, Twice Shy were MTV mainstays. The latter reached number five on the Billboard Hot 100 and went gold. Watch the video here. The band had seven top 10 hits on the mainstream rock chart, including Save Your Love, House of Broken Love, Call It Rock and Roll, and Rolling Stone. An earlier track, a cover of The Angels' Face the Day from Great White's 1986 sophomore album Shot in the Dark, earned heavy airplay on Los Angeles rock outlet KMET FM before the band broke nationwide the following year. Fueled by Once Bitten, Twice Shy, the group's fourth LP, Twice Shy reached the Billboard 200 Top 10 and 1991's Hooked and 1993 compilation disc, The Best of Great White, 1986 to 1992, are certified gold. Russell left the group in 1996 but returned in 2001 when it started touring under the name Jack Russell's Great White. Great White was the headliner at the Station Nightclub in Warwick, R.I. in 2003 when the group's stage pyrotechnics ignited a fire in the ceiling's acoustic foam. Within six minutes, the entire club went up in flames, killing 100 people, including band guitarist Ty Longley, and injuring 230. It remains the deadliest fireworks accident in U.S. history. Legal action against several parties, including Great White, was resolved with monetary settlements by 2008. Russell's survivors include his wife, 
Heather Ann Russell, and a son, Matthew Hucko. A public memorial is planned at a later date. Gina Rowland's a multiple Emmy winner who's captivating work in A Woman Under the Influence, and as the elder and dementia-ridden Allie in The Notebook also moved moviegoers, died Wednesday surrounded by family at her home in Indian Wells, California. She was 94. No cause of death was given, but the retired actress had been battling Alzheimer's disease, ironic in light of her famous film role. She retired from Hollywood in 2015 after earning four Emmy Awards, two Golden Globes, and two Oscar nominations. Her Oscar noms included A Woman Under the Influence and Gloria, both born of collaborations with her late husband, John Cassavetes. The duo made an indelible mark on American independent film, not just for the often revelatory end product, but also for the DIY way they made their movies. A Woman Under the Influence was prompted by Rollins, who wanted to delve into the difficulties faced by American women in their lives and relationships. When Cassavetes could not raise the money for the film, they mortgaged their house and borrowed from family and friends to make it happen. They shot with a crew made up in part by AFI students and not on a pricey, purpose-built soundstage set, but in an actual residence in Hollywood. Rollins won primetime Emmys for the Betty Ford story, Face of a Stranger and Hysterical Blindness, as well as a daytime Emmy for the incredible Mrs. Ritchie. She earned five more nominations from the Television Academy, the first in 1985 for her part as the mother of a young man with AIDS in the groundbreaking and early frost. Her son, director and actor Nick Cassavetes, spoke to Entertainment Weekly about the notebook role. Born in Cambria, Wisconsin, Roland moved to New York after a stint in regional theater and made her Broadway debut in The Seven-Year Itch, touring in a national production of the play. In 1956, she starred in the Broadway play Middle of the Night opposite Edward G. Robinson. Rollins co-starred in the 26-episode syndicated TV series Top Secret and guest starred on many TV anthology series. She later was a regular guest on many top TV shows. In 1959, Rollins appeared in the Western series Laramie and later alongside her husband, John Cassavetes, in the detective series Johnny Staccato. Rollins made her film debut in The High Cost of Living in 1958. Rollins and Cassavetes made 10 films together, including Faces, A Woman Under the Influence, which garnered a Best Actress nomination, and 1980's Gloria, which also spawned a Best Actress Oscar nomination. Rollins was married to him from April 9, 1954, until his death on February 3, 1989. Survivors include her husband Robert and children Nick, Alexandra, and Zoe Cassavetes. Perry Kurtz, a comedian who appeared on season eight of America's Got Talent, as well as on The Late Late Show with James Corden, died Thursday in a hit and run in the LA neighborhood of Tarzana. He was 73. His death was confirmed by the LA County Medical Examiner's Office. An official cause of death is deferred pending an autopsy. Perry was struck by a gray Honda Civic at around 11.20 p.m. Thursday, according to law enforcement sources cited by TMZ, he was pronounced dead at the scene. TMZ reports a suspect has been arrested on suspicion of felony hit and run causing death. Kurtz auditioned in the sixth episode of season eight of America's Got Talent in a rap act about judges Howard Stern, Heidi Klum, and Mel B. All three hit the buzzer and he was eliminated from the competition. His first gig in came in 1977 when he entered a talent show at the Crazy Horse Saloon in New Jersey taking a $250 first prize for singing a parody of Eleanor Rigby as Jerry Lewis. From there, he headed to San Francisco to pursue comedy full-time. In San Francisco, he spent much of his time at the Holy City Zoo Comedy Club, where he improvised with Robin Williams, and followed Williams more than a dozen times at management request, according to his bio on the Entertainer's Worldwide website. In 1989, he relocated to Los Angeles, where he became a paid regular at the Comedy Store in Hollywood, and also appeared at Dangerfields in New York City. According to IMDb, he appeared on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno in 2014, and most recently on The Late Late Show with James Corden in 2018. Robert Weatherwax, a second-generation Hollywood animal trainer and the son of Lassie co-creator Rudd Weatherwax, has died. He was 83. The late trainer's son, Robert Jr., who has also continued in the family business, announced his father's death on Friday, with a throwback photo of the two of them and one of the rough collie descendants of the original Lassie Dog actor pal.
It is with great sorry that I announce the passing of my legendary dog training father, wrote Robert Jr. in the Post. He was born exactly one year after my grandfather's MGM Lassie. Pal, I'm proud to be the last representative of the greatest dog training family in history. Rudd created Lassie for CBS in 1954 with producer Robert Maxwell. Robert Weatherwax Sr. joined his father on the show in the early 60s, continuing to carry on the Lassie legacy after Rudd died at 77 in 1985. The family voted to sell the character's trademark in 2002. Due to my father's genius, we transformed the training of dogs from simple props on a movie set into actors who seem to behave with human-like emotions, Robert previously said in his bio. Dad was a transitional figure in Hollywood animal training, and my experiences with him from childhood to adulthood have transformed my life and made me who I am today. I hope that my father's lifelong labor of love, of which I am proud to have shared by his side, will be uplifting in a world that, more than ever, needs some inspiration from the past, he added. In addition to his work on Lassie, Robert trained the dog Einstein from the Back to the Future films, as well as animals on Big Jake, 1971, The Thing, 1982, and Dennis the Menace, 1993. The Weatherwax family has been in Hollywood since Rudd's father, Walter. Weatherwax moved the family to Hollywood and got into the business. Robert's uncle Jack trained Toto in The Wizard of Oz, and his uncle Frank trained Spike, the dog who starred in Old Yeller, 1957. Peter Marshall, who hosted the popular game show The Hollywood Squares for more than 15 years and had a long career as an actor, singer, and comic, died today of kidney failure at his Encino home. He was 98. His publicist Harlan Bowl confirmed to News to Deadline. Marshall won four daytime Emmys for hosting the syndicated Hollywood Squares from 1966-81. The tic-tac-toe game featured two contestants agreeing or disagreeing with celebrities who provided answers to Marshall's questions, which ranged from silly to ribald. The format has been revived a few times over the years, with a new edition hosted by Nate Burleson with Drew Barrymore in the Fame Center Square is to premiere in mid-season. Among the scores of stars who appeared on Hollywood Squares were Walter Matthau, Gloria Swanson, Glenn Ford, and Milton Berle, as well as regulars Paul Lind, who often killed as the center square, Rose Marie, Nipsey Russell, Cliff Arquette, and Wally Cox. Marshall went on to host other TV game shows, including All-Star Blitz and Yahtzee. Listen to people, have fun, and know the game. That's basically all you have to do to be a good game show host, Marshall said in a 2019 interview for the Television Academy Foundation. Know the game thoroughly so if something goes wrong, you know how to rectify it. And most importantly, enjoy the people. He also hosted the Peter Marshall Variety Show, Big Bands from Disneyland, and the audience participation series Fantasy with Leslie Uggams. Born Ralph Pierre Lecoq on March 30th, 1926 in Huntington, W.V., Marshall had a long career in showbiz before his Hollywood Squares gig. Boasting a memorable voice, he worked as a DJ for Armed Forces Radio after being drafted into the Army stint during World War II and as an NBC page and a theater usher. Marshall teamed with Tommy Noonan in 1949 for a comedy act that sold out nightclubs and did The Ed Sullivan Show twice. They appeared together in movies including The Rookie, 1959, and Swingin' Along, 1961. He had bit parts in some early 1950s movies and became a contract player at 20th Century Fox, appearing in such films as Ensign Pulver, The Cavern, and Annie, in which he played radio crooner Burt Healy. Marshall got his TV start guesting on 50s variety shows as part of a comedy team with Tommy Farrell. Later that decade, he appeared in episodes of series including Men of Annapolis and The Millionaire. He also appeared in Manhattan Tower, the first color special NBC aired. Marshall made his Broadway debut in the short-lived 1961 play How to Make a Man and returned as a star of the 1965-66 musical Skyscraper. Those shows came after he starred with Cheetah Rivera in Bye Bye Birdie on stage in London's West End. His other musical theater credits High Button Shoes, Anything Goes, The Music Man, and 42nd Street 
From 1983-87, Marshall performed the lead role of Georges in more than 800 performances of La Cage aux Folles on Broadway and its national tour. He also starred for two years as Lenny Gans in the national tour of Neil Simon's Rumors. Marshall authored the 2002 memoir, Backstage with the Original Hollywood Square. He is survived by his Lori, his wife of 35 years, daughter Suzanne Browning and Yaimi DeMarco, son Pete Lecoq, 12 grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. Another son, David Lecoq, died of COVID complications in 2021.